Good morning. Uh, my name is Wen Juan Zhu uh, from University of Illinois at Abana Champion. Uh, thanks for the organizer to invite me here. Uh, today I'll talk about uh, 2D material electronics. Here I will discuss the primary electrical calculations on 2D materials and the electronic device based on 2D materials. On the electrical calculation, I'll discuss the carrier mobility, the band offset, and the barrier height in 2D materials and the hydrostructures, uh, the gap states, and the band gap measurement in 2D materials, and a quantum capacitance measurement. First, let's look at mobility measurement. For mobilities, typically there is three different methods to extract mobility. The first two is based on the transistors. It's called effective mobility and field effect mobility. So effective mobility is defined of the drain current divided by the inversion charge. So inversion charge usually approximate by the capacitance times Vg minus Vt. So this is a large signal uh, capacitance. So referring to this figure, it's corresponding to the slope of ID divided by the Vg minus Vt. The field effect mobility is defined by the transconductance. That's a derivative of ID versus Vg. So that's corresponding to the slope at any given point of ID Vd curves. So that's a small signal uh, mobility. Most of the case, before the reach uh, at the maximum, the slope, maximum transconductance, these two mobility are similar. But beyond that point, effective mobility is generally larger than the field effect mobility. The limitation of these first two uh, methods is if there is a large amount of traps in the semiconductor or in the 2D materials, this can overestimate how much charge in the inversion layer because not only the mobile carriers are going to be accounted, but also the trap charge will also reflect it in its total count. <clears throat> so we will overestimate the carrier density and underestimate the mobility. The third way to, make, uh, to extract mobility is by Hall effect measurement. So this is a typical configuration for Hall effect measurement. If we apply a current along the channel, and in the meantime, apply a vertical magnetic field. Then the low range force is going to deflect, deflect the electron holes, so it's going to flow in the y direction and build up a voltage called Hall voltage. This Hall voltage will be proportional to the magnetic field and inverse proportional to the carrier density. So we can extract this carrier density from this Hall voltage. This carrier density extracted here only include the mobile carriers. The trap charge will not follow this uh, magnetic field, so it will not contribute to the Hall voltage. So we can get an accurate measurement on the carrier density and the accurate extraction on the mobilities. So the mobility will be calculated by the Hall volt, the uh, conductance along the channel called magnetic resistance or magnetic conductance divided by the carrier density. So after measure the mobility, then we can analyze what is the source that is causing the mobility degradation. What's the limiting factor? For graphene, the limiting factor of our um, mobilities are typically uh, these four different kinds. One is the coulomb scattering, that's from impurities, the trap charge, or the uh, charges from the gate dielectric or substrate. The other one is the salt ring scattering. That's from the lattice defect. If you have missing one graphene a carbon item, then this can cause a short range scattering. Another source is the phonon scattering. For graphene, the phonon scattering uh, can come from graphene itself. It also can come from the underneath silicon dioxide substrate. If you have a top gate, it can also come from the top gate dielectrics. So this phonon scattering short range scattering and a coulomb scattering were determined what's the mobility in the channel. So left graph shows the measured mobility for graphene uh, sample and the calculate mobility based on different scatterings. So the top line is the mobility limited by graphene phonon. 
and this dashed line is a mobility limited by silicon dioxide phonon. So that means in this graphene transistor, the phonon scattering due to the substrate is actually stronger than the phonon from graphene itself. So that means if we remove the silicon dioxide, suspend the transistor, we can get much higher mobility for graphene. And people did uh, suspended graphene and reached the mobility over 100,000 centimeters square per volt per second. So the red graph compares the mobility from single layer and a bilayer. So if we plot the mobility versus temperature, for single layer, we found that the mobility will decrease when we increase the temperature. This is due to the phonon scattering. If we increase the temperature, there are a larger number of phonons in the silicon dioxide, then we have more scattering rate, lower mobility. For bilayer graphene, however, if we increase the temperature, the mobility will increase. The reason is the extra layer of graphene in bilayer graphene can in some extent screening the phonon scattering from the silicon dioxide substrate. So in this case, the short coulomb scattering will dominate. If we increase the temperature, the carrier will move faster, so less impact by the impurity charge, then the mobility will increase with temperature. For MOS2, the scattering source is similar. The difference is for MS2, the phonon uh, limited mobility due to MS2 itself is very strong. So here shows the measured mobility as a function of temperature and the simulated calculate mobility limited by phonons and impurities. So the top one is the mobility limited by acoustic phonon from MOS2. And this blue line is the mobility limited by Homer uh, phonon. Okay, so then uh, the, the third one is uh, the mobility, okay, sorry, this one is a polar phonon, and the other one is acoustic phonon and a homer phonon. So the dominant scattering source for MS2 is this optical polar phonon. So the difference between the homer polar and the uh, optical polar phonon is, is illustrated here. So the in-plane optic, uh, polar optical phonon, the sulfur atom and uh, molybdenum atom move in different directions. But in homer phonon, these two sulfur atoms move in opposite direction. So there is no net change on the position of the positive charge. So we have less impact on the scattering of the carriers. The dominant one is the polar phonon. We can see that by the, the phonon limited mobility from MS2 itself is already in the range of a few hundred centimeters square per volt per second. So this is much lower than the mobility uh, limited uh, by graphene phonon uh, in graphene transistor case. So that means if we remove the silicon dioxide substrate in MS2 transistors, the maximum mo we can, mobility we can achieve is still going to limit it by the phonon scattering from MS2 itself, which is around 400 centimeters square per volt per second. So this gives an upper limit of the mobility we can achieve in MS2. Another other few factors that will limit the mobility, what impact on the mobility is the number of the layers. For 2D materials, since the material is already very thin, any number of uh, change on the number of layers is going to change on the band structure. That will change the mobility as well. So this graph shows the mobility as a function of carry density uh, for electron branch and hole branch compared single layer versus bilayer graphene. We can see that if we increase the carry density, the mobility will decrease uh, for single layer graphene while it will increase for bilayer graphene. The difference between these two is the density of states between single layer and a bilayer. For single layer, we have linear, uh, the band dispersion relationship. For bilayer, we have a parabolic band. This will give the density of states for single layer is linearly increased with energy, while it is a constant for bilayer graphene. The scattering rate for Coulomb scattering and the short range scattering 
is proportional to the density of states. So this different uh, energy dependence of density of states will give different carrier density dependent on the mobility. So for single layer, we can calculate that the mobility will decrease with the carrier density, while it will increase for bilayer graphene as observed uh, experimentally. The mobility will also in, uh, influence by the direction the carrier flows or the crystal orientations. Here shows the black phosphorus uh, structure. For black phosphorus, if you look at uh, from the top view, it has a hexagonal structure. But if you look at the side, it has this buckled structure. So here, if we define x direction along the armchair and y direction along the zigzag direction, the effective mass in this armchair direction is much lower than in the zigzag direction. The effective mass can be 10 times different. So if we measure the Hall mobility along these two different directions, we found that the mobility along the x direction is much higher than the y direction. This is due to the lighter effective mass in the x direction. That, that's for mobility calculation. Now we'll discuss the barrier height and band offset in 2D materials. If we put a metal on top of uh, 2D materials, then we can find on uh, TMDC, then we can find a uh, form of uh, short key barriers. This band, uh, uh, the band offset between the metal and the TMDC can be measured uh, by temperature dependence of IV. This is based on the thermal emission current. If the thermal emission current is dominant current in the junction, then this current can be expressed by this equation. It's related to the barrier height and the temperature um, in, the, in the device. So if we plot the log drain current versus one over T, we can extract the barrier height. This equation uh, is only valid that if thermal emission is a dominant current. If we have too high reverse bias on this short gate barrier, then this barrier can be thinned so that the tunneling current can be, uh, can be a dominant source, then this extraction will no longer valid. Within this range, if we plot this uh, log current versus one over T, we can extract the barrier height for different metals. So here, uh, the author found that the barrier height between MS2 and these four different metals that can be changed if we change the metal work function. However, this change in barrier height is only 10% of the work function difference between the different metals. That means if we change different metals, we can tune the work barrier height, but only at a very small extent. The large of the the barrier height is determined by the band gap, the interface states in MS2. So where the energy, the interface state located in the band gap will determine the band gap, uh, the barrier height, instead of the metal work function. So in order to deepen this uh, Fermi level, we need to add an extra layer between metal and MS2. One possible approach is to use graphene. So here shows the uh, MS2 graphene uh, contact. From this uh, temperature dependence of IV, can extract the barrier height between graphene and MS2. We found that if we increase the back gate to make it more electron doped in MS2 and graphene, this barrier height can be reduced dramatically, much faster than the titanium MS2 contact. So this reduce of barrier height is because if we put bi positive bias on the gate, then we can introduce electrons in the graphene, also more heavily indoped on MS2. So both of these two will reduce the barrier between graphene and MS2. So this can be an effective approach to reduce uh, the contact resistance. This temperature dependence of IV can be also used to measure the band offset between two different uh, 2D materials, or uh, two different uh, semiconducting materials. Here's one example. In this case, 
the black phosphorus is deposited on top of zirconium oxide nanowires. So the band offset between these two materials can also measure by temperature dependence of IV. Here it's assumed that black phosphorus is more like a metal and treat this junction as a short key barrier. So if we reverse bias this pin junction, measure at different temperatures, we can attract the barrier height or band offset between these two materials. Another way to extract the band offset between two different semiconducting materials is by measuring the conductance in one material and observe the transition uh, uh, at a certain point. So here is one example. A graphene hull bar is fabricated on top of MS2 flake. So if we measure the conductance in graphene as a function of gate voltage, at the whole branch, the conductance increase with negative gate bias. So this is typical behavior for a graphene transistor. For the electron branch, however, when we beyond the direct point at a certain voltage, the conductance start to saturate and slow down. This transition point defined as a threshold voltage, this identifies the point that the electrons start to populate in MS2. So as shown in this band diagram, when we add more and more electrons in the graphene, and this will introduce more band bending in MS2, at some point, this Fermi level in graphene will be aligned with the conduction band edge of MS2. So the electrons start to fill up in the conduction band in MS2. Once this starts, the conductance will reduce because the mobility in MS2 is much lower than graphene. So by measuring this threshold voltage as relative to the direct voltage, then we can extract the band offset between graphene and MS2. So the third uh, parameter we can measure electrically is a band gap. For gra bilayer graphene, if we apply a vertical field, that will increase the band gap from zero to a finite number. And this band gap can be measured electrically. The left graph shows the resistance of the graphene transistor at a function of top gate at different back gate voltage. So the maximum resistance that corresponding to the resistance at charge neutrality point is a function of the total electrical field built up by both top gate and back gate. So if you plot the maximum resistance as a function of the displacement field caused by do both top gate and back gate, we can see that at zero displacement field, the resistance is minimum, smallest. If we increase the vertical field, the res resistance is going to increase. This because if we increase the vertical electrical field, we're going to increase the band gap of the bilayer graphene, and that will reduce the carrier density at the charge neutrality point. The, this carrier density at charge neutrality point, it depends on two factors. One is the barrier height, the other one is the temperature. The larger the band gap, the less possibility for electrons to distribute it in conduction band and the valence band. And the, the higher the temperature, the, the higher possibility to have electron to be populated in the conduction band. So if we plot the ratio between the resistance at a given electrical field then as a function of the electrical field, then we ex can extract the band gap. Okay. So uh, the next I will discuss the gap states in um, TMDC materials. The reason we want to measure gap states is the, the charge that's trapped in the gap state can highly impact on the carrier mobilities and other device parameters, such as sub swings. This is not only for important for tra traditional MOSFET, it's also going to be important for TFET that we discuss later. These gap states will impact how much off-current we're going to have uh, in, uh, in the MOSFET and the TFET. The gap state density can be measured in many different ways, 
Here's uh, two different, uh, two typical methods. One is multi-frequency CV. So measure capacitance at different frequencies. The other method is AC conductance. So measure the conductance at different frequencies. The principle of, of these two measurements uh, can be illustrated here. If we have the gap state within the band gap, if we apply an AC signal on the most capacitor, then the Fermi level going to move up and down with the AC signal. So when the, the, the trap level is below the Fermi level, it's going to be occupied by the electron. When it's above the Fermi level, it's going to release the electron. It's going to be emptied. So this AC signal will cause a charging and decharging of these gap states. That will introduce a capacitance called interface trap capacitance. In the meantime, it, this has a certain amount of resistance that is called uh, interface trap resistance. So with this, this uh, equivalent model for a device will look like this. When we do the measurement, capacity measurement, if in a series mode, we simplify it, we'll assume that the device has one capacitance in series with a resistance. So this means the capacitance we extracted going to have the information of the interface trap in it. To get this interface trap density, we measure at different frequencies. At the low frequency, the trap will respond to the AC signal, but at high frequencies, because the signal is too fast, the trap states don't have enough time to trap an electron or detrap an electron. It will no longer respond to the AC signal. Then this, this two part will not there anymore. So by compare high frequency versus low frequency, then we can get information of how much trap in the device. So here shows the capacitance measured at different frequencies. By looking at the frequency dispersion, we can trap the trap density. If we look at more mathematically, then we can calculate the total impedance of the, this structure. The total impedance will be taking into account all these components add together in series or in parallel. And the measured capacitance will correspond to the imaginary part of the impedance and the resistance or conductance will correspond to the real part of the impedance. So by fitting this capacitance at different frequency, we can extract the interface trap capacitance. The AC conductance is similar in principle. It depends on how the frequency is going to change the response of the interface traps. The AC conductance, if you plot AC conductance versus frequency, there is a peak <coughs> showing up, and this magnitude of this peak corresponding to the density of the uh, trap states, and this resonance frequency corresponding to the uh, trap time constant. So if the trap is very shallow in the band gap, it can exchange the electron with the conduction band very quickly, then the time constant will be short, then the response frequency will be uh, higher. If it's deep in the band gap, then the tr uh, time constant will be longer, then the frequency will be uh, slower. So here shows a measure different voltage. If bias in the band, uh, close to the band edge, we have a higher response frequency. So based on this result, we can extract the interface trap density as a function of gate voltage and time constant of this interface trap uh, gap states. For this particular sample, we have two different gap states. One is located close to the band edge, we mark as type B. So for type B a trap, the time constant is much shorter because it's closer to the band edge, conduction band edge. The other type is located in the middle of the band gap, marked as type B. So this one have much longer uh, time constant because it's deeper in the band gap. So this trap states can highly depend influence on the mobility we extracted. As we mentioned uh, previously, the effective mobility from a transistor is taking into account all the carriers, charge carriers in the channel, no matter it's mobile or not mobile. 
So the total carrier density was including two parts. The carriers that are in the conduction band, which contribute to the conductance, and the carriers in the localized states, which do not participate in the conductance. So in order to get the true band mobility, we need to know how much carrier is really in the conduction band. By measuring AC conductance and multi-frequency CV, we can extract the number of the carriers in the localized states. Then we can extract how much carrier in the band, uh, conduction band and get the true band mobility. So here shows the band the mobility extracted from effective mobility method, and the other one is corrected mobility, the true band mobility. We can see the mobility in the band is much higher than the effective mobility that people usually extracted from transistors. Now uh, move on to the quantum co conductance, uh, quantum capacitance in 2D materials. The quantum capacitance of 2D materials can be measured by uh, CV measurement, then eliminate the oxide capacitance from the insulator. Then the remaining capacitance is the capacitance due to the 2D material itself. At when temperature equals zero, this capacitance can be expressed in this equation. So the quantum capacitance, the definition is the derivative of the charge in the semiconductor over the potential in the semiconductor. That means when we tune the potential in the semiconductor to the material, how much charge we can introduce in the 2D material. So at tem uh, when temperature is very low, close to zero, this quantum capacitance is just proportional to density of states in the semiconductor. So the left graph shows the quantum capacitance measured on single layer graphene and a bilayer graphene. We can see that for single layer graphene, the quantum capacitance increased linearly with the gate bias, or the voltage uh, dropped on the graphene. For bilayer graphene, the quantum capacitance is constant. This is because the data of states for monolayer is increased linearly with the energy for bilayer graphene, the density of states of, is constant. So that means if we measure the quantum capacitance of a 2D materials, we can directly probe what's the density of states in that material. For MS2, the density of state is constant. So this is a theoretical calculation of the quantum capacitance of MS2 at different temperatures, 300K and 77K. So beyond the conduction band and the valence band edge, the quantum capacitance is approximate constant due to the constant density of state. But inside the band gap, the quantum capacitance, it depends on the temperature. It's because if the Fermi level is below the conduction band edge or valence band edge, there is a finite amount of charge that can participate in this capacitance, depends on the temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher the possibility to have charge populated in the conduction band. So the capacitance, quantum capacitance will be larger. It can be expressed uh, in this equation. So by measuring quantum capacitance, we can prove the density of states. We can, in some extent, we can also measure the extended gap states in these materials. So that's a basic uh, electrical calculations for 2D materials. Now I will move on to the electronic device based on 2D materials. First, uh, look at a uh, logic device. So logic device has been extensively studied in uh, CMOS technology. So now uh, the industry are working on 14 nanometer technology. So the channel is shrinking shorter and shorter. When we shrink down the channel length, there are many uh, problems can arise. One is the short channel effect. Here shows the energy diagram for MOSFET. If we have a high drain bias, if the channel is very long, the potential lowering due to this high drain bias has very little impact on the total barriers. But if we shrink down the channel length, this lowering of the potential the barrier on the drain side 
will also impact on the barrier on the south side. Now the total barriers is not only controlled by the gate, but also controlled by the drain. So this is a short channel effect. In order to minimize this effect, <coughs> the approach the industry typically take is to scale down the gate oxide thickness or scale down the, the channel thickness. So the gate have much better control on the channel then can minimize the short channel effect. So a typical approach is to change the bulk silicon into SOI. So the silicon thickness is shorter or shrink down, further shrink down the silicon in the SOI to make UTSOI or ETSOI stand for extremely thin SOI. <coughs> if we scale down the silicon channel, the problem is the mobility will reduce when uh, thinning down the body thickness. So here shows the mobility reduced dramatically if we shrink the channel thickness below three nanometer. This is based on Tony's result. So in order to solve this problem, we can use uh, 2D materials. For 2D materials, the channel is atom atomically thin. So that's the ultimate uh, thickness for the channel. <coughs> So potentially, we can scale down the channel further. So here shows the drain current versus top gate voltage at different drain bias. From the threshold of this IV curve at high drain bias and the low bi drain bias, we can extract the DBO, drain induced barrier lowing. So if we plot the DBO as a function of channel length, we found that the DBO won't increase until the channel Thick lens shrink down to 32 nanometer. This device uses a very thick dielectric 30, 30, uh, 60 nanometer hafnium oxide. If we scale down the gate dielectric to 3 nanometer, we can extrapolate that this channel thickness can further scale down to 7 nanometer. So this indicates that TMDC can potentially use for short channel logic transistors. Based on the logic transistors uh, made by on TMDC, the many different integrated circuits were also made. Here's two examples. The left one shows the inverter based on WSE2 and WS2 grown by CVD. So this is a lateral hydrostructure. The, the red one showed the BP MS2 in, uh, inverter. This is uh, made by Steve's group. So that's for logic device and a logic circuit. Another type of device that we can make is RF device. For graphene, it have high mobility, but a zero band gap. So it's not suitable for logic device, but it can be used for RF device to have a fast switch. So RF device is referring to the device can operate in radio frequency. Radio frequency is referring to the electromagnetic wave with a frequency between 3K to 300 uh, gigahertz. So this is a typical RF device, top view. So the top and the bottom are the source electrode. On the left side is the gate, on the right side is the drain. So the input signal will put in the gate and the output signal will measure from the drain. So these two were connected to the network analyzer, the two different ports. So by changing the frequency of the input signal, then we can measure the output signal at different frequencies. One key figure of merit of RF device is called cutoff frequency. So cutoff frequency is defined as a frequency when the current gain, H to one equals to one. So the current gain is the current or the output current at the drain divided by the input current at the gate. So we can derive that this cutoff frequency is proportional to the transconductance. It's related to the DC uh, performance divided by the capacitance. So the red figure shows a cross section of RF graphene RF device built on silicon carbide. Since graphene have very high mobility, that means it will have very high transconductance. The cutoff frequency can be very high. 
So in the past few years, uh, a lot of RF device and RF circuit has been demonstrated. So like graphene built on silicon carbide or graphene grown on CVD, uh, by CVD method. The highest cutoff frequency that has been demonstrated so far is 427 gigahertz. In addition to individual RF device, the RF circuit will also build to integrate these inductors, capacitors, together with the RF device to make uh, amplifiers. So all integrated into one chip. Although graphene has very high uh, cutoff frequency, the major problem of graphene used for RF device is the Fmax, the maximum oscillation frequency of power gain. The maximum oscillation frequency is defined the frequency when the power gain uh, equals to one. So we can derive that this F max is related to the cutoff frequency in addition to other extrinsic parameters. For example, the poly resistance or the series resistance. Most importantly, it also depends on the output conductance, the GDS. The output conductance is defined the derivative of drain current versus drain voltage. So for traditional silicon MOSFET, this is a typical IDVD curve. So at a high drain bias, the current will saturate. So the output conductance will close to zero. That means this term became zero, the F max can be very close to the cutoff frequency. For graphene, however, there is no band gap so you couldn't have a depletion in the channel or a pinch off in the channel. So that means the current will keep going when you increase the drain bias. That means the transconductance, the output conductance, GDS, is very high as compared to silicon or 3 5 materials. That means the F max can be much lower than the cutoff frequencies. So that's the primary problem for graphene-based RF device. Here shows the state of art of RF device. Compare graphene uh, uh, RF device with traditional 3.5 and a silicon uh, RF device. The highest cutoff frequency is reached by indium phosphide, ham fat, high electron mobility transistor. The left graph is the cutoff frequency. The red graph is F max, the maximum oscillation frequency. In both cases, the highest frequency reached is indium phosphide ham fat, uh, hamped. Graphene is very close to this highest cutoff frequency. Um, so that means it's very compatible in terms of cutoff frequency. However, the F max for uh, graphene is much lower than indium phosphide uh, due to the zero band gap. Recent years, people start to look at MS2 and the BP RF device. As compared to graphene, MS2 and the black phosphorus has lower mobility. So the cutoff frequency is generally lower than graphene. However, since they have a finite uh, band gap, the F max actually is very comparable to FT. So in terms of uh, power gain, these two material can be promising. Now I'll move on to the tunnel device. So tunnel device, um, including the tunnel fat and the tunnel diode. First, I'll discuss the tunnel fat, tunnel lithium effect transistor, also called TFAT. The reason that people are interested about TFAT is the TFAT can reduce the substrate swing. That means we can reduce the supply voltage or reduce the power consumed by the transistors. So this will be important for low power applications. For traditional MOSFET, the smallest uh, substrate swing we can make is 60 millivolts per decade. This is limited by the Boltzmann distribution of the carriers. So even at uh, we have a zero interface trap, we, the, the minimum uh, substrate swing we can get is 60 millivolts per decade. In order to overcome this limit, we have to change the uh, device physics fundamentally. TFAT 
is one of the solutions to overcome this limit. So here shows the operating principles for MOSFET and TFET. For MOSFET, in the off state, the electron can somewhat ionically jump over these barriers. There are always certain amount of carriers that in the high energy tail depends on the Fermi Dirac distribution. So those electrons have a high energy can jump over these barriers. In order to cut off this uh, off current, the tunnel fat was built differently. So for most fat, typically structure is NPN or PNP. So source and drain has the same doping type. For tunnel fat, the source channel and drain have different configuration. For example, PIN or NIP. So source and drain have opposite doping. So the band diagram will look like this. In the off state, due to this staggered uh, um, band alignment, the electrons in the valence band cannot tunnel into the channel or the drain because there's no available state in this region. So we can effectively cut off this off current due to these electrons in the high energy tail. So that means we can have much lower off current that will reduce the subtract swing. So here uh, compares the IV characteristic between a MOSFET and the TFET. So for MOSFET, the bulk silicon MOSFET, this orange line, that's illustrate the traditional MOSFET. If we use multi-gate to enhance the gate control on the channel, we can reduce the off current, so reduce the subtrial swing. If we increase, if we use a high mobility material like 3.5, we can increase the on-current shown in this purple line. If we use TFET, then we can make a steeper subtrial swing shown in this green line, but a lower on-current because TFET is based on the tunneling. So this tunneling generally have a lower current than in-plane transport without the tunneling barrier. So if we operate at high gate voltage, there is no advantage for using TFET because the on-current is lower, the transistor is operating slower. But if we operate at a low gate bias, then the TFET will have an advantage. It has better on-off ratio and a high on-current. So the TFET is promising for low power application. There are many different possible configurations for TFET. The left graph shows the traditional TFET based on silicon. So we have P plus, N minus, N plus channel, so the current can tunnel from source to channel. This region, brown region highlight where the tunneling occurs. This, in order to reduce the, this uh, parasitic current at the bottom of the channel, so make the substrate swing steeper, then we need to reduce the channel thickness as shown here. So use SOI or uh, ETSOI for this uh, purpose. <coughs> if we shrink down the, the channel, not only we're going to reduce the mobility, but also if the channel thickness is reduced to a certain limit, we're actually going to increase the band gap due to quantum confinement that will reduce the tunneling current. So in this case, if we use 2D material to replace this channel, then we can have the, solve the problem of the quantum confinement and address the problem of the mobility degradation at the ultra thin channels. So potentially we can have high on current and low off current for TFET. <coughs> uh, so this top three structure are all uh, have the same similar configuration is the current is flow laterally and the gate is controlled vertically. This is called lateral defect. We can also configure this device in a different, uh, different way. It's called a vertical defect. It, instead of arrange source, channel, and drain laterally, we can stack them together in the vertical direction. So in this case, the current will tunnel vertically and the electrical field also control vertically. So that means this, this tunneling direction is in the same direction of the gate electrical field. 
This is called vertical T-fat. Okay. <clears throat> the advantage of vertical T-fat is this tunneling, instead of tunneling through this line, especially when we send down this channel, instead of tunneling this small line, now the tunneling is through a plane. So the tunneling area can be much larger. That means the on-current can be larger. So in this configuration, if we replace this structure with two 2D materials and use a vertical height structure, we potentially can have atomically sharp junctions and achieve high on-current and low off-current for TFAT. The simulation of 2D TFAT has showed promising result. Here shows the TFAT as compared to high performance CMOS or low power CMOS and a 3.5 material based TFAT. This, uh, this line, these uh, symbols are the TFAT based on 2D materials. We can see that the 2D TFAT can have either lower energy or shorter delay as compared to the bulk material. We also simulate the, the BP based uh, TFAT. As compared to TMD based TFAT, the BP TFAT has a much higher on current. That's because the mobility of black phosphorus is much higher than TMDC. And also, black phosphorus is a direct band gap, so the tunneling probability is higher. This is a theoretical uh, simulation. In real device, it's much more challenging uh, to actually realize this uh, steep subsurface swing and high on current. That depends on many extrinsic factors, like how many gap states in these materials, how good is the contact. Recently, there is one demonstration of 2D TFAT experimentally. This TFAT is built based on MS2 on germanium with a liquid ion a gating, electrolyte gating. So this TFAT, vertical TFAT, shows the subtle swing much lower than 60 millivolt per decade and relatively high on current. So this indicates it's possible to make a 2D TFAT. Another type of tunneling device is tunneling diode. So tunneling fed is a three terminal device. Tunnel diode is a two terminal device. So traditionally, tunnel diode have uh, two different categories. One is called Isaki diode. The other is called resonance tunnel diode. In uh, Isaki diode, it have a pin junction, degenerated dot. So N plus uh, with a P plus junction. So if you put a bias on the pin junction, then the electron can tunnel from N-type to P-type materials. But if the bias is too large, that the valence band in the P-plus region now is lower than the conduction band, then there is no available state for the tunneling, then the tunnel current will reduce. So if you plot the current versus the bias across the pin junction, it starts at the beginning increase with the gate bias, once this valence band is below the conduction band in the n-type, then the current starts to drop from NDR, negative differential resistance. Another type of tunnel diode is resonance tunnel diode. In this case, it uses a um, quantum well, usually based on 3.5 materials. So when the electron energy in the emitter is the same level as the energy in the quantum well, the electron can resonate the tunneling from emitter to the well. It has generated a high current. When this energy level in the quantum well is below the conduction band of an emitter, then the electron can no longer tunnel through this barrier because there is no available energy level in the well. Then the current will reduce. It will also form a negative differential resistance. So that's uh, two, uh, based on traditional 3D material. Recently, people also demonstrate 2D tunneling diode. So this is a few examples based on the Isaki diode type of uh, device. The left one shows MS2 WSE2 vertical heterostructure. So if we bias the WSE2 
versus MS2 such that the valence band of the WSE2 is above the conduction band of MS2, then we can have band-to-band -band tunneling. <coughs> and this will form a negative differential resistance. But this only observed at very low temperatures. Another heterostructure that shows NDR is the black phosphorus and tin disilinite. The tin disilinite have very high electron affinity. And BP and tin selenide, when they put together, they will form a broken band, band alignment, as shown here. So BP is P-type doped, and tin selenide is N-type doped. So naturally, they will form a exactly doped configuration. So this will show a very strong negative differential resistance, even at room temperature. Another type of tunneling doubt based on 2D is based on RTD. So if we put on two different gra uh, two graphene layers separate by a boron nitrite, when the direct cone between these two materials are aligned to each other, then we have a resonance tunneling from uh, NDR. So this, all this tunneling device potentially can be used for terahertz emission and terahertz detection, or multi-value logic and a memory circuit. How many minutes I have? You're writing your time right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now I'll skip the memory and uh, short key uh, barrier. You can read it later online. Okay. So, in summary, for 2D materials, we can have a variety of different electrical categorizations. Uh, for example, mobilities and barrier height and barrier, uh, band offset between two, two different materials. In heterostructures, the band gap, gap states um, by AC conductance or multi-frequency CV can also measure quantum capacitance, which will reflect directly the disk of states in the 2D materials. We can also use this 2D material to form many different kind of uh, electronic device, for example, logic device and circuit, RF device, and short gate barrier device, memory device, or tunneling device. So these devices have many unique features. For example, um, ultra, thin, uh, ultra short channels, or it can have a low power application or high frequency applications. <coughs> okay. Okay. Here I would like uh, to acknowledge my former colleagues in IBM, my students in UIUC, and my collaborators in Tsinghua University, University of Minnesota, uh, University of Massachusetts, Yale University, and Columbia University. Thank you. Uh, the main problem is the mobility is much lower. Right, uh, so what is uh, the actual mechanism for that? Um, is that understood? Or? Yeah, I think there are many different factors. One is uh, sulfur vacancy in CVD grown MS2. So that will cause the uh, impurity charge. Uh, also, uh, so that will lower mobility. Is that, uh, uh, is that neutral impurities or, or, or ionized? Um, I think most, most likely it's ionized, okay. I think, yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, in the devices where you're using the bilayer of uh, MOS2 and graphene, you characterize the band offset. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't understand why, once you turned on the MOS2 channel, the graphene didn't continue to short out the measured conductivity. It's still. So if you look at the conductivity, it's still increasing, but at a slower rate. So the black line is the... So the black line is the conductivity. It's still increasing with the gate bias, but slower because there are less carriers in the graphene. The red line is uh, the carrier density in the graphene. Okay. 
So uh, yeah. let's thank uh, um, which one again?